right, so we're going to get back up and running here. Hope everyone enjoyed their lunch, had a chance to get outside, uh, see some of the sites that the mayor mentioned before, the flood and economic development project right outside our windows here. Um, we are very excited for today's keynote speaker uh, and um, the individual who's going to precede him, who is going to introduce him as well, uh, and that I have the opportunity to introduce, uh, is Elizabeth Hughes, who is our State Historic Preservation Officer at the Maryland Historical Trust. Hopefully, most of you already uh, know her, but if you don't, um, after her remarks here, you get a chance to say hello to her. Please do. Um, Elizabeth is, for those of you who don't know her, is a, a native of the Eastern Shore. She's been with the Maryland Historical Trust for over 20 years and has served as the State Historic Preservation Officer since her appointment by Governor Hogan in 2015. Um, in addition to her duties here in Maryland, she's also served as the President of the National Council of State Historic Preservation Officers. Uh, she has a master's degree in architectural history from UVA, undergraduate in American studies from Georgetown, and I'm very pleased to to say that she is a good friend and a great friend of Preservation and Preservation Maryland, Elizabeth. Thank you, Nick. I'm so pleased to be here today in Frederick. Um, you know, the Maryland Historical Trust, it, our partnerships are so important, and we're so very pleased to be able to sponsor, along with many others, the Old Line State Summit. It's great to have these opportunities to get together as a preservation community. There are no new problems. Uh, it's so important for us to be talking to one another about solutions that we found. I hope that if you do nothing else, you leave today with at least two new names and numbers in your Rolodex, if you've, people even have Rolodexes anymore. I guess they don't. That dates me a bit. But, but but please do 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 that. Um, while I'm here today in Frederick, I will say that uh, part of me, my mind, is in Annapolis today because there's a very important event taking place. Uh, the transfer of the Smith Price family remains that have been in the care of the Maryland Historical Trust at the Maryland Archaeology Conservation Lab since the 1980s when an excavation funded by HUD inadvertently uncovered these human remains. Uh, we took them in and we have cared for them over the many years that they've been with us. And recently the descendant community has reached out and wanted to have those remains returned to them so that they could be re-interned and recognized properly. So we are so pleased to have been a part of this process. The transfer um, to the descendant community is happening today. It may have already happened by now. I'm so very proud of the Maryland Archaeology Conservation Lab staff who have been involved in this process and who have been the caretakers um, these many years. So I do want to mention, mention that today. We could not do our work without your support, without the support of Preservation Maryland and other partners. We've been very fortunate to have a great deal of funding available under the Hogan administration for our various programs, from the Maryland Heritage Areas Authority program, which is now funded at $6 million a year, to funding for our Capital Historic Preservation Grant program at $600,000, our Non-Capital Grant program at $300,000, our African American Heritage Preservation Grant program funded at a million dollars. Uh, we couldn't uh, sustain that funding if it weren't for your advocacy throughout the uh, General Assembly session, often led by Preservation Maryland, but it requires all of you to, to be there talking to your elected officials. We can't do that sort of advocacy work being part of state government. So thank you for the work that you do on our behalf to ensure that that funding is available for the great work that's happening in local governments, communities all across the state. It's really essential. Um, to us being successful as a state historic preservation office and a preservation community. Looking ahead, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see that the publication of our State Historic Preservation Plan is imminent. Uh, that planning process involved many of you, many of your organizations, uh, many of you responded to surveys, participated in focus groups uh, across the state. 
And really the work that's, that's outlined in that plan will be guiding the preservation um, community over the next five years in terms of how we prioritize funding, um, new partnerships that we hope to create. Uh, for our part, the Maryland Historical Trust is excited to be providing support for underrepresented communities through work that we've done with women's suffrage, with African American Civil Rights Movement in Baltimore, that Baltimore Heritage was, was integral uh, in working on, as well as Preservation Maryland and others, um, and working with LGBTQ resources that really haven't been looked at before. We're looking at developing an electronic Section 106 process that we we see many other SHPOs around the country have started that work. Increasingly electronic applications for grants, um, ultimately probably for tax credits, uh, that's coming down the pike. So, so we're excited to make our programs more accessible and more user friendly and efficient uh, for the public. Um, the other thing that I would say is climate change, a big concern. We heard about it today, if you attended the session earlier today. Uh, that's something that is increasingly on our minds, uh, and it's something that we're going to have to be facing together as a preservation community. So thank you very much for your support throughout um, the year in the legislative session, through our planning processes, being partners in our, our grant programs. Thank you to Preservation Maryland for the great work they're do, co doing, connecting all of us. And please don't hesitate to call on us as a resource. We have many of our staff here today. A lot of them are sitting at the same table, so they've got to <laughs> filter out. Please say hello to them and, and make connections. It's my honor to be introducing to you the keynote speaker today, and I brought my glasses to be sure that I could read the introduction. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Jim Lindbergh when he was in Baltimore um, a, a few years ago, and uh, really it was a wonderful experience having the National Trust focusing on adaptive reuse of historic properties in Baltimore City. I think there were a lot of really good recommendations that came out of that work, um, and it was just a pleasure to have him in, in Baltimore. It's great to have him here today with us again. If you haven't met Jim, Jim Lindbergh is a senior policy director at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Based in Denver, he works with partners across the country providing policy research and solutions for more inclusive, healthy, and resilient communities. Jim has led several nationally recognized preservation and sustainable development projects for the National Trust, including the adaptive use of a former dude ranch in Rocky Mountain National Park, and the green rehabilitation of a historic school in Denver. He's the author of numerous articles and books on architecture, planning, and preservation, and is a lecturer in the College of Architecture and Planning at the University of Colorado, Denver. So please join me in welcoming Jim. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It was, uh, it was indeed fun to work together a few years ago in Baltimore and learned a great deal from you and the experience there. Um, and, and Nick, thanks as well for, for your leadership. Um, you know, I think when I talk to my colleagues at the National Trust, um, Maryland is, is regularly recognized as, as a leader in preservation, and a lot of that has to do with these two great organizations and the wonderful leaders uh, that you have. And I want to thank also the staff who put on this event. Congratulations, sold out. Beautiful day uh, to be in Frederick. So delighted to join you and be with, with all of you across the, from across the great state of Maryland. Um, Maryland's also known as, as an innovator. And uh, again, that's why I'm so happy to be with you today to have a chance to share some ideas from work that we've seen or been involved in around the country, but also to get you thinking about what more you can do because we have high expectations. Um, you know, certainly Maryland is known for its early work on state tax credits, uh, for its smart growth planning, leading the nation there. Um, all the way up to work on, on urban disinvestment and the challenges there and the challenges of sea level rise that we see today, and I know there was a session on that. Uh, a lot of that innovation continues today, um, thanks in no small part to, to many of you in this room. So we really appreciate it and again, look to you for good ideas in the future. I want to also bring my thanks and um, greetings from colleagues at the National Trust around the country and down in our DC office. Um, 
including Paul Edmondson, who some of you know was recently named as president and CEO of the National Trust. Um, if you don't know Paul, he has been at the Trust for actually longer than I have, 32 years, I believe. Uh, Paul is an attorney, he's our chief legal counsel, has led our very um, talented and effective law department for many years, and he's just going to be a terrific leader for the National Trust. I know he'll look forward to, um, to getting to know all of you as well, if you haven't met him, um, getting out around the country, hearing what's going on and what we can do to partner more with, with, with all of you. Um, also, I think you know many National Trust staff live in Maryland, and some of them e have even come up to work here, so it's always good to be back um, to see old friends and colleagues here in Maryland. Um, what I'm going to do today is quickly highlight, highlight some research I've been involved with at the National Trust uh, that I think might be of interest to you if you're not aware of it. And then I'm going to pivot to a focus on policy, what we can do with that research, how we can apply it and make a difference in our communities. In particular, to take advantage of what I think many of us recognize is a unique opportunity um, at, the pre at the moment. With preservation as a movement maturing, we celebrated sort of our official 50th anniversary a couple of years ago. We have a lot to be proud of, a lot of accomplishments to look back on, but also much more that we can do in the future. And I think in particular a chance to integrate the values, the principles, the practices, and the benefits of preservation into new collaborative efforts in planning, in resource conservation, and in community development. To learn from the past, which we do well, what has worked and what hasn't worked, and to make preservation what I call the new normal. Wouldn't that be great? So we have a ways to go. Um, yesterday I flew into Dulles from Denver, that's a pretty close airport, and drove on up to uh, the Frederick area. Um, being late and making my plans, um, Jessica was terrific and um, figured out where I could stay, which ended up being uh, south of town along I-70 in a, you know, corporate hotel, perfectly nice, utterly ordinary, and to me, a completely strange experience. Uh, I haven't been out enough lately, I think. Um, I was without a car, and there were no sidewalks anywhere nearby, so I had to bushwhack my way uh, to get a bite to eat through uh, parking lots and berms and drainage swales and six-lane highways and you know, right? But I made it safely, um, kind of a stranger on the landscape. Actually, I saw another group of adventurers heading out from our hotel um, who tried to do the same thing, I think, and, but they turned in another direction and I never saw them again, so <laughs> hopefully that turned out okay. Um, you know, it was all fine, good food actually, but a little disorienting. So, you know, we've all been there, right? We, we know that world. Um, but I imagine most of you are here today because you've had other experiences, different kinds of experiences in older places. Places that were made for and continue to serve people more than cars, that are healthier and safer, that are more interesting, more memorable. Places, I believe, that are more hopeful uh, when we think about creating a better generation, better future for the next generation. So just take a moment and think about a place you've been. Maybe it was lunch today uh, that sticks in your mind um, as a memorable place. What did it look like? What did it feel like? What did it sound like? What were people doing there? Well, for me, a place that sticks in my mind is this one, and I have to apologize. Uh, <clears throat> this is in Philadelphia, uh, which I'm sure there are even better examples in Baltimore, another community here in Maryland, I, I'm sure. But this image stuck in my mind because I, I, I was here uh, in this place about five years ago. It was actually at the National Alliance of Preservation Commission's meeting. Anybody else there? Philly, 20 something. Um, and I was walking around Center City and I walked back toward the the Penn campus to the west, and I stumbled across this really remarkable intersection where I stood in the middle of the street for several minutes and just absorbed what was going on. There were 
no cars passing by, no horns honking. That's just the occasional sound of a bicycle pedaling past, tingling their, be tingling their bell. The tinkling of forks and the din, the din of dozens of conversations among patrons of perhaps a half dozen restaurants nearby, all sitting out on the sidewalk on a warm July night, enjoying the evening and conversation with friends and colleagues and neighbors. It was a place for people, not cars, and a place with a tangible sense of history, a warmth, a character, a human scale, uh, a place that really was for people. And also a place that came to be, by the way, because of a small piece of public policy, believe it or not. This is the wonky part. Um, in this case, a little ordinance change that Philadelphia made to make outdoor seating easier to get a permit for. And they saw, over the course of about 15 years, a 439% increase, which means they went from less than 100 to more than 400 restaurants in the center city area, putting seating outside when the weather's nice. Transformed downtown, led to a, bolt, a, a, a downtown um, restaurant revitalization and renaissance that really has, has never been seen before in Philly. And I think, you know, we know in preservation that it's moments like these uh, where people, people gather together, enjoy each other's company, um, that often occur, it seems to us, in older places, along main streets, at a farmer's market, in a repurposed factory or a warehouse, or maybe it's just in a favorite old local restaurant or coffee shop or bar. So we see that connection. We think there might be a connection between older places and the kind of communities that people enjoy. So is that right? Is there a connection? Or are these just the wistful, wishful, anecdotal memories of old, dedicated preservationists like me and maybe you too? Well, I'm going to try to put some science to this, some data to test this. Um, and <clears throat> share with you uh, some work that we've been conducting over the years at the National Trust to really scientifically investigate the connections between old places and all kinds of metrics and indicators of the connections between old places and community health and vitality. And to do that, we're using the increasingly available data that's available about all, all kinds of uh, characteristics of place, looking at the correlations between the physical character of places and a range of vitality metrics like walkability, business development, employment, density, diversity, sustainability. Is there a connection? And this is research that we undertook not as an academic exercise, but because it comes at a time, we think, that uh, we are facing, and I think you would all agree, some serious challenges around how our cities and towns will grow in the future. Big challenges. Not just what cities look like, but also who they are for, and how they impact issues like climate change and equitable development. So let's start with climate. It's a subject you all um, here in Maryland have been looking at perhaps as much or more than any other state. And think about the connections between climate and old buildings. We'll start with one statistic, 99%. That's the percentage of buildings left over, okay, do the math with me, after you subtract all of the newly, structure, newly built structures each year. So to state it another, another way, new construction adds about 1% to the building stock annually. So there's a lot of talk about new green buildings, but actually what we do with the other 99% is way more important. It's what really matters. So what are we doing? What do people think we should do? Well, in the name of sustainability, you've perhaps heard some advocate for accelerating construction of all kinds, perhaps encouraging demolition of older structures to make way for new, theoretically, greener buildings. Is this a good idea? Well, we in preservation have countered, you've probably done this, with the statement, the greenest building is the one that already exists. You've used that, right? It's a good one. People seem to get that. Don't tear it down. Well, is it true? 
about uh, several years ago, we tested this solution, this assertion, um, where we conducted research to compare two scenarios. One, a rehab and retrofit of an existing building. That's scenario one. Scenario two, demolition and replacement of an existing building with a highly efficient new building. And here's the summary of the findings. So this chart, I recognize this is a little hard to read and to see. Um, it took me a while to figure this one out myself. But what the chart is showing is annualized, so annualized um, CO2 emissions from the two scenarios. The new construction is in blue and the rehab scenario is in red. And as you can see that first year, we did some work on the old building and we built the new building. So there's a lot of impact that year. But then as operations went into effect, and the new building, which is going to be in this test case, more energy efficient than the old structure, um, starts to show the benefits of uh, saving energy on an annual basis, the operating energy going down. Now what's that dot? That dot is where the two lines cross. And it's 42 years from the date of the start of the project using this test case scenario, which happens to be from Portland, Oregon for an office building. So think about that. A new building replacing an old building, the new building being highly energy efficient, using less energy annually, but taking more than 40 years before we see the life cycle benefits when it comes to CO2 emissions begin to actually show up. So this idea, this year of carbon equivalency, which we named this, is one we tested um, in different scenarios around the country, different climate zones, different building types, and we found that it takes, on average, between 10 and 80 years to reach that year of carbon equivalency. In other words, that's how long it takes before a new green building actually saves on our CO2 emissions compared to the retention and reuse of an older building. Well, I think now, more than we knew even when we did this study, we know that we don't have 80 years. We don't have 40 years. We may not even have 10 years before we need to start seeing benefits from how we treat and invest in our built environment. So in fact, <clears throat> the far better solution to that 99% question is to look for ways to save existing buildings whenever possible, to retrofit, retrofit them for maximum efficiency, and we know we can do that too, and to focus new construction on infill sites. And I'll have more to say about that, but suffice it to say at the moment, there are many opportunities for that. So that's one way that we, our research, I think, has shown the value of retaining older buildings, conserving, reusing older buildings across our landscape cities, towns, neighborhoods. Another study I want to highlight for you in a little bit more detail is, is a more recent study that, again, perhaps some of you have heard of. And this was a, another case where we tested an assertion, in this case one that um, <clears throat> Jane Jacobs um, promulgated back in the 1960s when she was fighting urban renewal schemes and her idea that cities need older buildings that they benefit uh, cities in all kinds of ways, bring vitality, and encourage social and economic diversity. Was she right? As it turns out, no one had actually really tested this, so we felt it was time, especially at a moment when some were starting to question whether Jane Jacobs, in fact, had it right in an era of um, urban revitalization and growth. So we conduct this study by, again, using data uh, that's available, particularly from assessors' uh, files in cities across the country, um, looking at the urban landscape initially of three cities, and then we expanded this nationally, um, dividing each of those cities up into equal 200 meter by 200 meter grids, which is about the size of a square block and a half, if you can kind of imagine that. And then gathering data on three variables. So here is age. Then we looked at diversity of age within each of these 200 meter by 200 meter squares. So um, <clears throat> when buildings were constructed, the range of date built uh, data for each of those grid squares. And then the, the size of parcels and buildings or the granularity. How many parcels, how many buildings showed up in each grid square? It ranged from anywhere from one in some cases per grid square to as many as 40 or 50 in older neighborhoods. And then finally, we added all this up, 
these three variables into something that we've called character score. And this is an important concept to remember because I'm going to refer to character score here as I go through a few of our findings. And remember, it's not just about age, it's also about size of buildings. Uh, the urban, the old urban grain, if you will. As I said, we started with three cities, San Francisco, Seattle, Washington, DC, and they have, have since gathered data of this type on every block, for every block and every building on every block in more than 50 cities across the country. And it's captured in something we call the Atlas of Reurbanism, um, which is accessible online at the National Trust website if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it. And again, we developed this as a tool for planners, for preservationists, for developers, for those who care about uh, their communities and are seeking to better understand and manage uh, some of their most important assets, and that's their old buildings and old neighborhoods and to see, up, see how they stack up, how cities stack up against each other across the country in a national context. So here's Baltimore. We did map Baltimore. Um, this got started when we worked together with Elizabeth and, and others. Um, and I illustrate this just to show again how these maps work. There's two broad cat categories, as you can see, two colors, red and cool, blue. Um, in red are those areas of high character score. So the red and orange scored highest when it comes to, to character score, and the areas in blue scored lowest, and just divided the city in half, essentially, along that um, set of metrics. <clears throat> well, through the Atlas of Reurbanism and our older, better, older, smaller, better study, we measured the correlations <clears throat> between these physical traits that I outlined and some 40 indicators of urban vitality. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate our findings using some Google Earth images from Denver. And again, on the left, we have um, tip a typical area of newer, larger, um, less age-diverse um, fabric. And on the right, older and smaller and more age-diverse fabric, uh, approximately the same size from the Google Earth images. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit, uh, highlight some of the, the findings. Um, note that, yes, we did this research for large cities for the most part, and although we haven't had a chance to test this methodology um, in, in, in many smaller communities yet, um, our expectation is that we would find similar uh, kinds of correlations and patterns. And for those of you who get interested in this and want to learn more, there is, again, a summary report as well as maps and fact sheets on each of the cities we studied on our website. So I'm going to go through these quickly, uh, starting with one that's perhaps kind of obvious, right? Um, surprise, surprise, we found higher walk scores, higher transit scores in areas with uh, concentrations of older, mixed vintage, and smaller structures, the high character score areas. Perhaps not as intuitive, these areas have greater population density. We see this pretty consistently across the cities we studied around the country. And along with that, more units of housing, more units of different sizes and types, from single family to multi-unit apartments. Significantly as well, and frequently, more affordable housing as well. Now, other studies have shown that when it comes to affordable housing, about 75% of the units that are deemed affordable in this country are privately owned, privately financed units that have not received any subsidy, what some call naturally occurring affordable housing. Just the market rate is affordable. Well, much of this uh, naturally occurring affordable housing is in older buildings. In fact, a concentration of it uh, is found in many of the major cities around the country. And that older neighborhoods then are in fact, for the moment at least, and we're probably going to need to take action to see if this, make sure this continues, but for the moment at least, reservoirs of affordability. So another reason why it's important to hold on to these parts of our communities. They're economically diverse places as well. Again, perhaps not surprisingly, um, if you know Jane Jacobs and her theories, um, <clears throat> these are affordable space for small and new businesses as well. Um, and here, you know, this aligns with Jane Jacobs' thinking, as does the idea that many of these are local businesses. So remember, we're studying not just properties in historic designated historic districts, but the half of the cities we, we looked at where there are older, smaller, mixed vintage buildings. And these are the places where we also see more locally owned businesses and fewer chains. So it's not 
south I-270. <clears throat> And again, I think an important finding um, as we think about who our cities are for, these are neighborhoods and districts that support and um, provide opportunities for more women and minority owned businesses. Um, again, related to the idea that you can start a business, that you can sustain a local business in often affordable places. We got data from Dun and Bat Bradstreet uh, that we think is particularly important in showing these findings in so many cities across the country and point to ways that we can um, retain and perhaps enhance the inclusiveness of, of our older neighborhoods and communities. There's also a question, and I think a finding, that relates to a question of density. And we often think of density in terms of square footage, how much space a structure takes up, and that's important for lots of reasons. But there's another kind of density, and that's density of activity, density of use. And here we see older neighborhoods outperforming newer areas. These old buildings work 24-7. Uh, they were designed before the automobile, so they don't give over a lot of space to cars. Uh, and they provide more um, jobs per commercial square foot than um, comparable neighborhoods that are newer. They're also attracting jobs in the creative economy. Um, these are <clears throat> the kinds of jobs that include uh, arts, design, entertainment, advertising, publishing, software. Those kinds of businesses, those kinds of jobs are taking root and flourishing more often in neighborhoods with high character score. And again, going back to Jane Jacobs, what did she say? Old ideas can sometimes use new buildings, but new ideas must use old buildings. The data turns out to support her thinking. A couple more. Um, this is a finding um, where we just had data from one city, city of Chicago. Um, but what we found was, perhaps surprisingly, that these areas were also more energy efficient, even in their existing form, without a lot of retrofitting. Uh, in Chicago, we were able to get data on energy consumption per year per square foot for residential structures, single family to multifamily, and found that the areas where buildings were older and smaller and mixed vintage used 12% less energy per year per square foot than similar areas of newer vintage and larger size. So again, another reason why holding on to older buildings might be a good idea when we think about uh, mitigating our carbon pollution impacts. And this is, again, without having necessarily gone through a lot of retrofitting. There's more, more on the table that we can take advantage of there. Another single city finding, in this case Jacksonville, where we, um, with funding uh, from, a, from a foundation there, did an analysis and looked at, among other things, um, the connections between old places and what are some called civic commons spaces. These are you know, libraries, churches, religious institutions, theaters, art spaces, community spaces, found that they concentrate more densely in these areas of high character score. So this, this kind of fabric supports strong social connections and community. And then finally, um, going back to my example from Philadelphia, the data actually supports what I was seeing there on the street as well. We actually got some cell phone data, so where people are making calls and <clears throat> what time of day throughout the week. Not individual cell phone data, just you know, <laughs> animized uh, third party. Uh, I don't know where it came from. Um, no, I, I do. And, and it, so a good source, but um, allowed us to really measure uh, uh, vitality at different times of the day. And we found that <clears throat> older neighborhoods, at 10 o'clock on a Friday night, you're going to see more cell phone activity in these areas. So they are attracting restaurants and bars and nightlife, um, just like we thought they might. All right, so that's a lot to, to throw at you. Um, bringing it back to, to Baltimore, just a couple of highlights from our research uh, here in Maryland. Again, um, much like what I was just sharing with you, um, these neighborhoods are denser, uh, more small and new businesses locating there, more women and minority-owned businesses, and by significant amounts as well. Well, so the, these findings, you know, rely on data, um, which I think Jane Jacobs would have just hated. I mean, she just would have thought that's the goofiest study I've ever heard of. Go out and use your eyes, right? So, all right, let's do that. Let's do a little um, 
visual uh, field testing, uh, do a preference survey uh, in real time. This is San Francisco, uh, downtown, same street, same block, two minutes apart, different sides of the street. And I think what you see here is that, that preference survey in action. Where do people want to be? They want to be in the, on the side of the street where there are, it's actually a mix of old and new buildings and businesses, activity, and other people. There's a lot more going on. Um, these are the places where um, people want to be with each other, um, active, busy places. The other side is a, is a place to pass through quickly. So indeed, um, Jane Jacobs was right and that character counts and that cities and towns do need old buildings. So those are the two studies I wanted to share. Now, let's go back to what we can do about it. <clears throat> How can we make this happen? How can we make the conservation and reuse of older buildings happen more often, more readily, more quickly, and in more places? not just in the small section of Philadelphia where maybe people can afford to rehab older buildings, but in a, across that great city and others just like it, where there are it's wonderful fabric and historic buildings that is languishing. We have some experience about what to do. We have that 50 years of experience that I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> some time-tested approaches. For instance, of course, you know, one of our basic tools, historic districts, which have been set up to conserve and manage change in thousands of communities around the country, probably hundreds here in Maryland, if I'm not close to it. Um, and that's worked well. We worked well. But as I showed you earlier, the impacts are relatively limited. And not only that, the way we do this has in many ways been through an exception to the rule. <clears throat> We've um, required special settings in the software, if you will, for planning. <clears throat> so in a time when the challenges and the opportunities that we face are so great, is it enough when one of our basic tools, local landmarking, is only impacting less than one out of 20 buildings in the average city that we've studied. Well, to illustrate why this matters, um, I want to bring um, these three cities to the fore and look at the, the numbers for uh, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Philadelphia. So in green, you see the total number of structures in each of those cities, hundreds of thousands. And then in orange, you see the number of structures locally designated. And in this case, we're talking about tens of thousands. And then in red is really, I think, the important um, number. And that is the structures in those cities, and these are the cities of, not the metro areas, the, the structures in those cities that date from pre-World War II. And it's a large percentage, somewhere around two-thirds in each of these cities, maybe even a little more than that. These are the buildings that, you know, make up and are the, in many ways the cause of those high character scores that we saw in the findings that I just shared with you. These are the buildings and the neighborhoods that make up the DNA of our older cities, our older neighborhoods. How are we treating them? How are we encouraging conservation and reuse in these areas? What more can we do? Here's a really cool looking chart, I think, if you just step back for a minute. This, these are all of the 50 cities on our atlas. And so here again, using that color scheme of red and blue, in red and orange, those are the structures in each of the 50 cities that are pre-World War II. Red is pre-1920, orange pre-World War II. And in blue, post-World War, light blue is 50 years old. So if you add the red, the orange, and the light blue, those are all the structures in our cities that are at least 50 years old. And of course, as we know, that makes them National Register eligible. So we might be interested in them. How can we increase the percentage of those buildings that we impact through our work to raise the percentage of historic places that are conserved and historic buildings that are repurposed? So, whoops, oh, there's Baltimore, if you were wondering. Uh, so I'm going to offer uh, three, uh, strategies and examples that fall into three buckets. This is the policy section. Uh, and I think these are kind of useful buckets. 
And I hope that um, this will give you some ideas to build upon. I'm going to cover a lot of ground and hopefully just spark some thinking and ideas and ahas and oh, we've done that or mm, we hadn't thought of that. I'm also hoping this will spark some new ideas from all of you and that next time we talk, you'll have some new uh, examples for my list. We're counting on Maryland to keep innovating. Um, so I want to start with uh, removing barriers. <clears throat> How can we update, if you will, our um, development management software for a new era of interest and investment in older neighborhoods, older buildings, older communities? And for this section, I'm going to rely on um, and draw on work that we did with the Urban Land Institute and our preservation partners in five cities. Um, just a few years ago, including Baltimore, as Elizabeth mentioned, where we had a chance to work with, with Johns Hopkins and his team at, at Baltimore Heritage, um, with the Maryland Historical Trust, Preservation Maryland, and ULI Baltimore, uh, all together, thinking about, as people interested in preservation and real estate development and community development, what we could do to make um, reuse easier, faster, cheaper. What we could do to get obstacles out of the way, if possible, uh, and allow the market to do more of its work more um, successfully. So surprise, surprise, when we think about barriers, what do we get? We get zoning. Sorry. Uh, but this is important because in so many communities, it starts with zoning. It starts with old zoning that is out of date. Zoning that really doesn't match our visions, our comp plans, our neighborhood plans for the future. Those visions are great, but without zoning, how do you implement them? The zoning has to align with the vision. For decades, we've lived with outdated zoning codes and we've done those fixes, those band-aids, those patches, that special software to make the zoning better with districts and overlays and all kinds of tricks and tools. What if the zoning underneath all of that was actually good? That might make our work a lot easier. We would go beyond the 4% to the whole city on one night. At city council. What about that? Well, it's a big project. A few cities have done it. Um, it's worth doing because right now we have a system where if you want to build what you see on the left, if you want to invest in an older building or if you want to build a new one that fits in, you need a variance. It doesn't fit the code. Got to go through a hearing. Got to go through a process. It takes time. It takes money. By right development, you want to do something like this? Fine. That's easy. But more of the old stuff, that's hard to do. So hasn't worked. The system needs to be rebooted. <laughs> I'm going to get this metaphor across. I'm, gonna, I'm really attached to it. Um, worked hard on that. Had to find all that stuff. You wouldn't believe. I've got a whole file of it. Um, so what can we do? Well. So let's, you know, the sort of the, the structural philosophical shift is to flip this on its head. So better zoning codes make this the kind of development that needs a variance if you're going to do it at all and makes this by right. Think about what that can do, how that can really ease our work to support our work, to make even the work of a historic pre uh, preservation commissions easier when that underlying zoning isn't constantly throwing up infill projects that are totally out of character, but they're allowed by zoning. <clears throat> Well, there's lots of ways this can play out. Here's an example from Baltimore. Um, I think this is an image I took back when we were working um, with Elizabeth and, and Johns. Uh, the old code in Baltimore dated, I believe, from 1974. And for the most part, that code made corner stores, which are a typical pattern in Baltimore, across the neighborhoods of the city, and in many cities around the state, I'm sure, corner stores, illegal, right? You can't do it. Well, single-use zoning is, is, is the reason. Mixed-use zoning is the solution. And if we can put mixed-use zoning in place in older neighborhoods to allow um, them to flourish, to, to find new uses, to open up options for reuse and re revitalization, we've done a lot to encourage um, investment in our older neighborhoods. So codes like Transform Baltimore um, make these kinds of uses possible again. They legalize diversity and complexity, historic diversity and complexity, and historic development patterns once again, returning to our old patterns as the default setting for our cities. And removing outdated concepts 
like applying non-conforming labels um, to too many buildings and lots and uses and signage. Codes that are full of hidden language that presumes replacement. Um, this was the thinking back in the 50s and 60s when a lot of our zoning was written and is still on the books. And it makes investment in these properties, whether it's additions to older structures or maybe it's a new skinny infill project on a vacant lot. Well, if that lot's too small, it's non-conforming, can't do it, got to get a variance, got to go to a hearing. Six months later, still haven't gotten the approval. This slows down the process of reinvestment, revi revitalization in our cities. We can get this to go away, remove that obstacle, put that label on things that actually aren't contributing and aren't conforming um, like this. Okay, you knew this was coming. Barrier, parking. Yeah, this came up uh, pretty much at the top of the list in every city where we did the Partnership for Building Reuse. It's embedded in a lot of zoning codes, this kind of crazy formulas that we started developing in the name of, I don't know, what? Science, requiring parking be provided when you develop a property. Why would we do that? Got to get cars, nice concrete home. Well, <clears throat> this is changing. Um, I think we've seen the impacts of this to our cities, to our environments, to what it does to places, how it makes them safe maybe for cars. I mean, there's a lot of beautifully shaded, landscaped places for cars out there on 270, but not too much for people. Um, we spend a lot of money on this stuff. And when it's an historic environment, it's really a challenge. It's really a barrier because older buildings usually didn't come with parking. And, you know, they uh, were built at a time before we were dealing with those uh, vehicles. And we have to provide that. It says minimum, you know, minimum parking standards apply. So the worst case scenario is, and you see this, like here, a neighboring building gets torn down to provide the parking for this business. <clears throat> Well, this is changing, um, and in fact, it's changing really fast. If you're paying attention to planning and, and what's going on in other cities around the country, um, it's really exciting to see. A couple of cities um, here in the Northeast, Buffalo and Hartford, have led the way. Hartford, the first city to eliminate parking minimums citywide. They're doing a lot of smart things in Hartford, and that's a big one. Um, believe it or not, there's a proposal to do the same thing in a couple older neighborhoods in Houston. So we can do this. Um, this era is changing. I think we're kind of putting cars in their place. They still need to be accommodated. We got to deal with them until the transformation happens, whenever that is. Uh, but for now, let's not ruin historic places. Let's, let's, um, let's figure out more creative approaches, whether that's reducing par parking minimums, providing parking waivers, like Transform Baltimore does for historic buildings, uh, allowing shared parking encouraging shared use vehicles, um, all kinds of options uh, other than those minimums. Some cities are even putting in place parking maximums to really discourage uh, over parking. I'm just gonna touch really quickly on two other big systems that are undergoing change now and I think we in preservation and in planning and in smart growth can be part of these conversations and help um, good things happen. And one of the big ones again that came up in our work with ULI and preservation partners is building codes along with zoning codes. Building codes are sort of the big uh, piece of public policy that guides development and real estate. And these codes are evolving um, as well. And in fact, this has happened pretty quickly. Um, States like California, cities like Chicago, putting in place new building codes. Maryland has always been a leader in this field. I think you guys are pretty up to date on this, but if your community has not um, adopted um, the International Building Code and the Rehab Code within that, um, I encourage you to do so. To do this helps make building reuse and rehabilitation easier. It also makes small-scale redevelopment easier. Chicago has gone even farther, and I think that's going to be a model to really look at. Uh, we're going to be um, studying that as they roll out the implementation on that code uh, here in the next few months. Another code, and this is increasingly becoming important, are energy codes. Um, these are updated uh, every three years and they be are becoming increasingly more stringent as we again seek ways to make our building stock more energy efficient and less carbon polluting. <clears throat> uh, 
one of the things that we often see is a conflict between the prescriptive approach of some energy codes where certain treatments are required and the character of older buildings, whether we're talking about you need to insulate that factory wall that you're converting to lofts, but you're going to lose the character of it, or you need to change those windows. Um, <clears throat> Some, some have advocated for um, a strategy for historic buildings where we seek exemptions from energy codes, and that may be necessary now and then, but I'm not sure that we want that to be the answer writ large. If we want to show how older buildings can be part of the solution, how older buildings can help us, help lead us to a more sustainable and resilient uh, building stock, we actually need systems and codes that allow older buildings to shine and that future energy codes could be focused on not prescriptive treatments but actually on outcomes and performance. And this notion of an outcome-based or a performance-based code is one that um, a lot of code, code experts um, are interested in. We were involved a couple of years ago in a pilot in Seattle. Uh, where we tested an outcome-based energy code with a couple of historic projects um, and got property owners to um, track energy use after they implemented their rehabs using this alternative path to compliance. And they've turned out extremely well, um, exceeding the code requirements when it comes to performance uh, dramatically. And I think showing how older buildings in, in, can in fact be exemplars, not um, structures seeking exceptions when it comes to energy performance. We can build on the passive design features as sort of um, original green aspects of older buildings to help them comply. But this is an area where we still need to innovate and test because I think um, so far the jury's out here. Uh, the process can be cumbersome. Um, and so we need to, to find some, some ways to streamline this model and, and, and make it more readily uh, uh, adoptable around the country. So if you have ideas for that, um, that would be great. We welcome that. To put some of these ideas together in a package, um, you might want to consider a tool that um, cities have used called an Adaptive Reuse Ordinance, or an ARO. Um, these can be tailored to meet uh, local needs, but really the idea is to remove the kinds of regulatory barriers, code barriers that I've been talking about, and put that in a package that you can use as an overlay to encourage adaptive use in specific areas. Los Angeles really um, led the way here as an innovator. Um, it's a great story of how they um, used an adaptive reuse ordinance to encourage conversion of their um, amazing stock of uh, commercial um, pre-World War II architecture downtown, a lot of it sitting vacant, and converted a lot of that to housing and hotel use. Uh, more than 60 structures converted and rehabbed, uh, more than 14,000 new units of housing created uh, in those older buildings. Phoenix has taken that example and applied it to, um, in, initially in um, some districts of the city, commercial corridors, aging commercial corridors. You see the example here of the old steakhouse on the left, sitting vacant along one of their um, boulevards. Um, converted to a really cool new mixed-use project um, assisted by their new adaptive reuse ordinance where again they're making um, the process smoother, um, removing requirements for um, small things that don't impact projects but can take lots of time, um, certain kinds of landscaping or lighting or curb cuts or grease traps or whatever it may be, um, expediting that review, that process, waiving some fees, saving five to six months, saving ten to fifteen thousand dollars per project, and they've seen dozens of these implemented um, across the city as a way to just grease the wheels a little bit, encourage reuse as an option, make it easier to happen. The examples start <clears throat> getting built, more people see them, more of this starts to happen and momentum builds. Okay, now we talked a little bit about how to encourage reuse of existing structures. What about that other side of the equation? Um, where does new growth go? Where does um, new construction go? Because demand in many cities and towns is growing. Where are people going to go? And here um, we've done a, a study recently in Little Havana, a neighborhood that you may have heard of in Miami. It's actually one of the densest neighborhoods of, in Miami, a great historic neighborhood with incredibly rich culture, diversity of population, wonderful architecture from different eras, early 20th century to mid-century. How can Little Havana grow and evolve and accommodate um, change, which is expected to bring a lot of demand for new residents. It sits in the shadow of downtown Miami. 
We did a study that looked at the vacant lots in the neighborhood and then just applied existing zoning and found that you could add approximately 10,000 new residents and 2,500 new jobs and 550 new businesses in a little Havana, a dense neighborhood, without one demolition. So you can go from vacancy to vitality on those vacant lots without requiring the demolition of existing buildings. Well, that's one of our dense neighborhoods. Think about so many parts of our cities where, in fact, there's a lot of room for redevelopment. This has got to be part of the equation. This has got to be um, something that we advocate for, filling in vacant lots, making better use of parking lots, um, <clears throat> encouraging infill development at all different scales. Some other ways to incrementally densify older neighborhoods, um, unit sizes. This is something where the market is starting to um, uh, lead the way towards smaller uh, unit sizes. There's a demand for this. Some call it micro development. Um, you get more people in older buildings uh, than you used to. Um, these are examples from Denver, all of them um, small unit developments. Something I call pl uh, plus, plus one approach to, uh, to zoning looking at our zone districts and thinking about how they can allow incremental change and additions by right to make this easier, um, looking at our zoning codes so that this is encouraged and this is possible instead of codes that are overzoned, where you have um, multi-story uh, projects possible and in many cases you either get new buildings that don't fit in or you get uh, acquisitions and lot assemblies and land holding and then eventually demolition uh, in a neighborhood that is transformed instead of um, one that can evolve. And then finally on the barrier side, um, I think it's time that we look at our neighborhoods, including our historic districts, and think about allowing um, accessory dwelling units by right. Um, this is an idea that again, like no parking, is spreading. Um, it's one that we've seen work in communities of different sizes and different types. This happens to be a couple of examples from an historic district in Denver. Um, these are, are great projects. They're a way to add density in a way that's compatible with existing patterns that br can bring diversity, can bring income and economic benefit to property owners, especially if they're not coming with a lot of parking requirements. Um, so I think ADUs are something that you're going to hear more about and hopefully um, find a way to say yes to in your backyards. All right. That's probably controversial. Oh, well. I think it's important. Um, Jumping now to um, a couple of the other buckets, I'm not going to spend quite as much time on these, but I, I do want to talk about the other side of the equation, and that is um, regulations that can help manage change and reduce uh, unnecessary and unwanted demolitions. <clears throat> and here again, going back to zoning, um, when we think about what are our alternatives when we see a neighborhood where we want to manage change to prevent demolition, to encourage compatible infill, what are our choices? In too many communities, these are the two choices. You can go with the zone district that you've got, or you can do an historic district, and there's not much in between. And it really represents what I think we would consider to be a tools gap that we need more flavors, more choices, a bigger menu of options when we think about how to manage change to reduce demolitions, to encourage conservation and reuse in older neighborhoods. So these can go by a lot of different names. It starts with contextual zoning, and then we think about overlay districts that might encourage good design or actually reuse, like an adaptive reuse ordinance or the idea of conservation districts. And this is probably one that many of you are familiar with. It's actually an old idea from, I don't know, the 70s and 80s, actually. I think some of the earliest ones. It's coming back, and a lot of communities are looking at this as a way, again, to, to manage change, but to do that in a way that um, is not quite so fine-grained as an historic district. It might be a little bit more flexible, um, where you can manage change um, based on all kinds of criteria, not just historic significance. This is an idea that I think has enough um, momentum right now that we did a study recently for the city of Detroit that we put up online that's really an overview of conservation district programs in cities around the country. And if you're interested, please take a look on our website for that. Um, it's a great resource of the different ways that cities are doing this. And I know there's interest here in Maryland in this approach. We'd be happy to, to work with you to find those resources. 
Landmark ordinances themselves are evolving as well. Um, from the 50s and 60s and 70s when a lot of them were set up, we're going now from a kind of black and white, one size fits all strategy for um, local ordinances to one that is more full spectrum um, and really includes a lot of different ways of doing this. Um, thematic and multi-property districts like they've been doing in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, um, non-contiguous districts, cultural historic districts, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco have been leaders in that arena, looking at different ways that through our la landmarking process, we can design strategies that encourage the uh, recognition of uh, more diverse kinds of significance and the recognition of different ways to protect um, those places. Now, one last um, regulatory approach that I wanted to just spend a moment with <coughs> is one that it uses a different strategy to discourage demolition, and that's the demolition review ordinance. How many of you are working with those in your communities or have a demolition review ordinance of some kind where if you want a permit, you got to go through a process to see if the building's coming down as historic? How many? A few? Okay. This is becoming fairly common. A lot of cities, again, are looking at this as a strategy. But I have to say, this is, again, an area where we need more innovation. I think what we've seen in a lot of cases is process, but not a lot of impact. Um, Portland, uh, as you see illustrated here, has gone a little bit farther, um, not only requiring a review process for demolition, but actually requiring deconstruction of buildings that are coming down if they're at least 100 years old. And while we might not like the alternative de of demolition, reuse of the materials is certainly better than sending them to the landfill, and perhaps this policy can be, in its own way, um, discouraging of, of uh, demolition projects. But I think there's more that we need to do in this area to make these ordinances effective and impactful. So again, this is a place where welcome your thoughts and innovations. All right, final bucket here, incentives, right? So this is obviously so important. Um, we all know that these projects, these decisions come down to economics at some point. Um, and we need to be able to provide some help when, when we can and in different ways. And I want to start certainly with one of the, the basics here. Um, again, state uh, rehabilitation tax credits. This is the map of the uh, uptake so far around the country of states that have a credit matching the federal credit of some kind. And the map is becoming more blue every year. Um, there's still a little ways to go. And um, my colleague Renee Kuhlman, who some of you know, is. Um, been working with uh, partners around the country to get new credits and fill in the gray areas on this map, and we're hoping to have a couple more here, perhaps even next year. Um, we've also put out a publication recently on state tax credits, what's working well, and highlighting examples of success, and I'm delighted to say that Maryland, no surprise, is one of those places. Um, you all have, again, been a leader in this work. Uh, I think the um, the deeper credit that you all have for affordable housing projects is one of those innovations that um, needs to be um, adopted more places, that a kind of inclusive preservation is uh, illustrated through that work where <clears throat> we have a credit that not only saves the historic building, that's great, but that's not enough anymore. We need to do more. And ideas like, like your um, state tax credit that provide that incentive for affordable housing projects um, are great models. Um, you've been influential recently. Um, I understand from my colleague Renee that uh, Pennsylvania just passed a new stronger state cre credit and they very much modeled it on what you've done here in Maryland. So thank you again um, for your leadership. So we can combine preservation with all kinds of other policy programs and here's one I like a lot, uh, CPACE. Who knows what PACE is? few hands, that's good. Um, this is property assessed clean energy. This is an incentive that can help property owners uh, essentially decide to fund and implement uh, energy retrofit projects where they can save energy through a retrofit uh, and then pay for the cost of that improvement through an assessment on their property tax. And a great example from Milwaukee there, a great historic building, but also I know you have this program here in Maryland and have been putting it to use on Main Street among other places. And um, again, this is one where I'd love to see um, examples and ideas for how we can use this incentive for smaller scale projects um, in particular, because that's where we have a preponderance of older buildings. So your, your leadership there will be um, really critical and important. Thank you. 
Um, we also are looking and seeing more and more uh, communities thinking not only about how to incentivize the retention of older buildings, but also how they've been used, the businesses that give communities their character, their distinctiveness, investing in that kind of enterprise rather than those that are um, perhaps uh, common around the country. And a great leader here, of course, if you haven't heard about it, is San Francisco where they've um, established a legacy business registry and incentive. Um, and this provides grants to businesses and property owners, uh, properties where they've uh, been in operation for 30 years or more and have maintained a uh, consistent identity or name or craft. And this could be a business or a nonprofit. It could be a bookstore, a bar, a restaurant, a theater, an organization. Um, and it's been incredibly successful. Relatively small amounts of money, but sending the right signal and providing really tangible help to keep those businesses and organizations in place, serving their communities um, in culturally significant ways. More than 160 businesses now or, um, or nonprofits have uh, joined the Legacy Business Registry in San Francisco. And I know there's a lot of interest in this idea around the country. And our, our partner, San Francisco Heritage, has been just a great champion for this for this incentive and are um, a great resource as well. All right. Um, finally, I want to mention perhaps um, the biggest new uh, policy incentive that we've seen in some time, and that's opportunity zones. Uh, I imagine some of you have heard about this. This incentive was included in the new tax reform bill that was passed in Congress um, in 2017, and it creates a, a capital gains benefit for private investors in qualified opportunity zone funds uh, in one of 8,700 um, opportunity zones that have been identified, opportunity zone census tracts that have been identified around the country. These focus on areas of um, high poverty and low income. Um, and the map here on the left is one that we've put together um, where we're showing opportunity zones, which are in blue, um, National Register Districts in yellow, and then um, uh, rehab tax credit projects, federal rehab tax credit projects, uh, the blue dots. And we also have um, Main Street communities and districts listed as well. Um, because we think there's really a strong connection and overlap between these designated opportunity zones and areas where we see um, National Register designations, tax credit activity, and Main Street programs, um, as the statistics there on the slide show you. So this is a place for us as advocates um, <clears throat> for um, sustainable, um, inclusive community development, I think can be really influential. Um, this is a program that could be very powerful. It doesn't come with uh, much in the way of regulatory review or guardrails. Um, it's not like urban renewal, which although that was very destructive, there was ultimately um, federal review. Uh, we don't see that with this program unless we are able to combine this incentive perhaps with some others like historic tax credits, state tax credits, um, where we could bring the power of all of those incentives together and also that review process to make sure those projects are supportive of communities and inclusive revitalization. So this is a topic you know, for a whole session, a whole conference probably, if you haven't had one already. Um, I know there are a lot of people here in Maryland with a lot more expertise on this than I have. But <clears throat> I put it out there uh, as one to be um, thoughtful about and at the very least take a look at our online mapping tool if you want to kind of see what the, the connections are between these opportunity zones and um, your communities and, and places that you've designated or you might want to think about designating in the future. Well, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice and I'm probably trying your patience, so I want to wrap up and I really want to wrap up by just saying how much um, I'm inspired by what has gone on here in Maryland over the years. I mean, the number of um, dramatic before and afters that come out of Maryland, like this one, um, the number of creative projects, the way that organizations in the public sector and the private sector have partnered um, <clears throat> to make preservation such an active, um, successful force for community re revitalization and sustainable development is truly remarkable. Um, the creativity that you have brought, the commitment, the collaboration, I think, um, speaks well for the future. Um, we at the National Trust look forward to continuing to work with you. We think that together, with all of you in this room, um, we have a bright future ahead and we can bring preservation forward <clears throat> into the, to the next era when we think about preservation. And to really change that software, 
um, to return those settings back to default, right? The old urbanism that we know is so great. Um, to make preservation the default, to make demolition a last resort. And to do that, we know it will take time and commitment, but together, I know we'll be successful. Thank you. And uh, we do have time for some questions, if anyone has a question. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you could speak on the, um, sort of how uh, municipalities fund themselves. The property taxes versus the land value taxes. I see the property tax as a disincentive tool to preserving historic structures. And if you put the onus on Historic structures that that right. The property taxes puts a value on, on the building, not on the land. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. If you tear down that prop, that building, you're paying less taxes than you were. Right, right. I'm on a historic district in Chester County. Mm. And it makes me sad when I see people come to us with these ideas and these projects to renovate their school buildings, mm -hmm. and they have all the great intentions in the world to walk away with this. Yeah. Right. And the. I no, it's a good point. I think the flip side of that is that <clears throat> then you tax vacant land um, too low, um, and and encourage um, you know, retention of of parking lots or vacant lots. Um, land value taxes. I don't know whether that is um, allowed in in Maryland. Does anybody have expertise in that? In Pennsylvania, right, it's been the place. We actually talked about this, if I'm remembering right, um, uh, when we did the Partnership for Building Reuse. I think Pittsburgh has some, some history to tell there. Um, but I, in, in the Lincoln Institute for Land Policy, some of you may be familiar with that group, um, they really orient around that concept, that idea, and have some great resources. Um, it's something that I think could be a game changer for sure. Yes. Uh, my name is Shane Grimm. I represent the city of Memory Grace. My colleague is Diane Clare. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that you're saying can come with what we're trying to do in our uh, very small historic city. Yeah. Um, two of the things that, that I want to bring up to you was uh, parking. I mm -hmm. really want to visit our, revisit our old parking standards. Yeah. Everything that you said is what we're experiencing. But a lot of the things that you try to overcome are the people that say, well, I, I want to have a parking space right in front of my house. Mm -hmm. and there's kind of a healthy community uh, component of that yep. to encourage people that it's okay to, to have to park a block away. Mm -hmm. So, so those are one, one of the things that we're trying to overcome. I've seen in some redevelopment projects in our city where mm -hmm. you know we've had a few people come out and say, "Well, I, I, I'm going to lose parking." Well, no, you're not. You have six cars. They're, they're complaining they have six cars and they expect to. Yeah, uh, yeah. But the other thing I, I don't, you didn't really touch on in, in this presentation that I was wondering if you could speak to is one of the barriers to quality redevelopment or even redevelopment or reuse uh, of existing uh, housing stock or commercial is stormwater management. Mm. Um, it seems to be one of the biggest problems that we have, especially for redevelopment. Could you, could you speak to any experience that you might have with, with that? Boy, I, I less experience with stormwater management other than maybe some of the obvious you know, answers about green roofs and just looking at all the impermeable surfaces, trying to reduce those on existing properties. That <clears throat> can be a challenge um, because old buildings often fill their lots. Um, but, you know, I think doing that at a district level, um, you can usually find some opportunities for retention um, <clears throat> and absorption. And with parking, um, you know, I think probably the the first answer I give there is, you know, maybe try something incremental. Um, often I think we find that there's a lot more fear about the consequences and the actual consequences are really not um, what people worry about um, or they're not as bad as they worried they might be. So trying uh, incremental approaches might be the best way to go. Yep. 
Who else? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Klaus. I just wanted to give a shout out to your point about having something in between historic preservation as a local district and having nothing. Yeah. In Baltimore, we are losing buildings left and right in uh, national register districts that have no teeth. Right. And there should be a conservation overlay. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. There can be some pushback. Does anybody want to respond to that? What may be going on? That's great. Yeah. I mean, I think um, <clears throat> conservation districts are one of those tools that, you know, really fill that gap and I think are increasingly, we're going to want to look at that as, a, as an option to include in a kind of standard set of best practices. Um, we're working in Philadelphia right now. Um, to look at how that city could improve. They have a conservation district ordinance that hasn't worked terribly well. So and there's a few of those on the books. There's some lessons to be learned from those ordinances that have been in place, but it really haven't been used. Um, and really to work with Philly to um, <clears throat> bring a more full spectrum set of strategies to their program. Um, more tailored districts for different circumstances. Um, not every neighborhood's the same. So I think we need to respond to that. Walter. Can we uh, on all the gallons I mean, that the city of Baltimore has we are looking at it in Baltimore and it's in the early stages look at calling something like a historic conservation district and focusing on where the regulation would be demolition, demolition by the flags, and maybe even additions, but that's it. I mean that right. the the basics. Great. Excellent. Yes. The number of studies, including one from the National Trust, have shown that recycling buildings, pre World War II masonry buildings, is the greenest thing, the highest level of recycling yep. that we can do. But the public still doesn't get that. What is the National Trust doing to help with that? What do you think we should be doing in our local communities to make people understand that and get beyond? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, it, it, we can't say it enough um, to promote that um, idea that Greenest Building is the one that's already built. I mean, use that, use our study. Um, I think one of the things that, that is an opportunity for all of us to think about how we could um, work together, perhaps to take a study to the next level and um, do the aggregate analysis of, you know, how a city gets to their, to meet their carbon um, pollution reduction goals. How can you achieve that through reuse and retrofit and how you can do that quickly? Um, so I think, you know, we need to get involved in those kinds of policy discussions that are going on in many cities right now, make the case for reuse. That's where the, <clears throat> the landscape is changing, changing quickly. So jump into those, those policy discussions fully. Thank you. Who else? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah. Right. 
Make it make it something that feels like everybody can do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that. I think that's very much our hope that that we, in working with all of you, can be a force for that message. <clears throat> that you know, reuse is something we can all do um, at different scales, but um, to do it um, with buildings is hugely impactful. It's a good idea. To that point, why doesn't the National Trust start a TV show? Ah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, that easily and yeah. make it interesting and, yeah. and invigorating that whole topic. Well, I'll make that suggestion. Yeah. I have a feeling <laughs> there may be some barriers there, but it's not a bad idea. <laughs> not a bad idea at all. Here we yeah. There's some great programs out there already, too. All right. I think that's about time. We're wrapping up to get to the other sessions. Um, thank you so much mm -hmm. for coming today.